Assalamu alaikum everyone. In this episode, Sabrina Ghaffar Siddiqui from the Sakoon Network will be interviewing Muniza Sheikh. Muniza is one of the leading experts in Canada on labor law, employment law, human rights issues and Canadian politics. She regularly appears on Canadian television. Muniza is also the Ethics and Integrity Commissioner for the city of Brampton. In her personal time, Muniza acts as a board member for the Muslim Welfare Center, the Director of Communications and a board member for the Canadian Muslim Vote and a board member for Flair Airlines. Assalamu alaikum Muniza Sheikh. We are so honored and pleased to have you with us today. Thank you so much for talking with us. Fatma Salam, happy to be with you. So in Canada, um, a lot of people know about the amazing work that you've done, especially through the TCMV. Um, I, I'd like to hear from you, uh, you know, some of the, the organizations you've been a part of and the work that you're currently doing. So in terms of what I do, I am a labor employment and human rights lawyer. Um, I also hold a statutory appointment in um, the city of Brampton, where I'm the Ethics and Integrity Commissioner. Um, and then outside of that, I uh, do quite a bit of activist work, advocacy work with the Canadian Muslim Vote, um, and also work with um, Muslim organizations across the GTA um, when looking at minority rights for employees, um, working with um, young women on the criminal defense side, um, you know, doing talks uh, in terms of legal rights when it comes to women, racialized workers in various shelters across the GTA. So it is really important for me personally to give back. Um, I grew up in a household where, um, you know, financially things were not, you know, we were in a bit of a financially precarious situation, largely because I lost my father when I was 13. Um, my mom uh, was very loving. She was a fantastic mom, but, you know, it was very obvious to me that the biggest limitation that she had is she wasn't able to financially provide uh, for her children. So notwithstanding the fact that we had alhamdulillah, a roof over our head um, and there was you know always food on the table, hugs and kisses and lots of love and lots of laughter between us siblings, um, I could see that you know the fact that my mom wasn't educated, the fact that she wasn't able to you know, hold a job and financially support her children created a significant source of stress. And so for me, you know, really the driving force and desire uh, to, you know, do something with my life, so to speak, was really because I was tired of being poor. Um, that was probably the first driving factor. And then, you know, once I realized I wanted to be a lawyer and started practicing because, you know, we were so deeply ingrained within our community, um, within the Muslim community, specifically within the Indian Pakistan Muslim, Indian and Pakistani Muslim community in the GTA, I mean, giving back was, you know, it was a given for me, um, given the fact that, you know, I spent a lot of time with my community. And so that that's sort of where the journey started with me. And mashallah, you've come a long way, uh, you know, from these times that you speak of. What would you say has been your biggest achievement? Yeah. I think for me personally, the biggest achievement has been, um, I'm fortunate enough really fortunate enough to have young women in the young women pardon me uh, young people in the Muslim community um, come and speak to me about wanting to seek guidance so I, I have to tell you that it's you know it's one of those blessings that keeps giving um, because I remember uh, being a young student uh, you know completing my undergraduate degree and then later on completing my law degree and looking for that strong female mentorship specifically because it was really difficult for me personally, and I know this is a story that a lot of young Muslim women and even some young Muslim men can relate to, it was really difficult for me to find um, a strong mentor where there wasn't that alignment in terms of our moral compass, in terms of our religious compass. And so where I was looking for that guidance as a young person, I really had a lot of trouble finding it. So for me, one of the biggest achievements is that I get to be that person for some young, you know, Muslim person, whether or not they're practicing in law. And, you know, they look at me as someone who may be able to impart something of value. Um, and that's invaluable. Of course, uh, I can imagine, you know, losing your father was probably one of the biggest challenges in your life. But other than that loss, what would you say has been, you know, a significant challenge um, for you being on this journey? I think for me personally, and this answer might surprise you, it's twofold. So there's challenges and struggles that I deal with inside the Muslim community. So, you know, we speak a lot um, as Muslims about, you know, some of the challenges we face um, in terms of Islamophobia and just generally, you know, the hateful narrative that's propagated against our community in general. And while I certainly agree with it and have certainly been on the receiving end when it comes to issues as far as it relates to outside the community, I think one of 
Um, the, the things that are really quite difficult for me is the amount of othering and you know, almost this, this racism of sorts, really, um, that that's in our own community as well. So, you know, having an Indo-Pak background, I've seen that there's so much disparity between the way that we as Muslims from different ethnic backgrounds are able to come together. So that, to me, is a significant challenge. And that is also one of those challenges or one of those struggles that I feel as Muslims we don't speak about as openly. Um, we need to find that solidarity in our community. You know, admittedly, not every everyone practices Islam the same way. Not everybody holds the same um, sort of religious values. And there is a little bit of cherry picking that goes on. But I think, you know, we, I, I always say leave the worshiping um, aside and where we need to come together um, for political reasons or for social reasons, that solidarity is so critical. And I think, you know, where I hear this narrative um, as far as it relates to Muslim women around, you know, who wears, wears hijab, who wears niqab, who covers their head and what type of Muslim is she and who prays and who doesn't pray and this obsession with women's sexuality, that for me um, is something that really upsets me to the core. Because on the one hand, you know, I'll have people say to me, well, you don't look like a Muslim or you don't speak like a Muslim or you've got tattoos and you've got piercings. But on the other hand, you know, anyone who really understands what it means to be a Muslim, anybody who really understands how unbelievably diverse our community is, can look at someone like me and say, well, of course she looks like a Muslim because our community is diverse. So I think until we have that solidarity in the community, until we get to that point where we can stand together, we're not going to really be able to combat the external forces um, in the way that we should, because, you know, really we have this disparity and I think it's pretty transparent to non-Muslims. And I know, because uh, I know you personally, that faith plays a very big part in your life. It does. But I would like to hear from you, you know, how faith really, you know, has been central in your life. It has been. I, you know, I do consider myself, and it's, you know, it's like the dirty little secret from the girl with the tongue ring and the tattoos. I consider myself to be a deeply religious woman. I always have. It's just the way that I see myself. Um, and, you know, I made that little crack about it sort of being like a dirty little secret because I am very mindful, uh, particularly around those Muslims. And most of my friends wear the hijab, interestingly enough. So this is not, um, and I have friends who, um, who do not wear the hijab, um, who prescribe to very conservative values that don't align with me and I have girlfriends who, who cover their head who are so progressive and open-minded thinking and this isn't surprising to me at all because I understand the diversity of our community but faith is extremely important to me but I do believe as a Muslim that you know Allah is all forgiving um, you know and he loves all of us and so for me I don't prescribe necessarily to this very narrow um, definition of what a Muslim should look like what a Muslim should act like um, for me it's just about you know being a good person um, of course, you know, Salah is, as you know, always been a big part of my life. It grounds me. I always have looked at Salah as not just a fundamental, but sort of that daily five point uh, checkpoint throughout the day that help, helps keep me grounded. So it plays a, a huge role in my life. I don't think there's a single blessing that I've been, uh, that I have that hasn't been, you know, without, uh, you know, it's it's really been because of my prayers, my mom's prayers. If, if you could go back um, as a role model to your own 14 year old self, yes. what would you say to her? I would tell her um, that she's worthy. I would tell her that she doesn't need to seek she doesn't need to seek approval from anyone. You know, that especially that 13 year old self who you know, lost her dad, um, you know, again, just, you know, you're 13, you're young, you kind of just want to fit in. You don't want to be the kid who like, you know, doesn't have $20 to like go on a school trip. You don't want to be the kid who's like, you just, you just really want to fit in. And I wish at that point I would turn to her and say, look, everything's going to be okay. But if you want to find success in life, of course, it's okay to, um, you know, seek help and assistance from other people, but you really have to believe in who you are. And I think, you know, self-awareness, self-appreciation and self-worthiness is probably one of the most important things. And it's the most, it's, it's, it's the area where I see the most significant deficiency as far as it relates to young girls and our Muslim young girls are no different. They're not immune from it. So that's what I would say to that 14 year old Maniza and that's certainly what I say to my 10 year old daughter. So for the viewers who would like to follow the work you're doing and see more of you know, the great um, efforts that you, that you have shown in the community, how can they 
uh, follow you and how can they reach you? Well, I'm on Twitter. So I'm Manisa Lawyer on Twitter. I also do political commentary for the CBC on a week to week basis. So you can find me on the CBC website. And if you Google me, it'll take you right to my firm's webpage. And I have a media page on there outlining some of the work that I do. I'm also on Instagram. So uh, I think a fair, go- you know, a quick Google will probably get you to where you need to be. Thank you, Manisa, so much for talking to us. Thank you, Sabrina. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed the interview. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell notification so you're alerted as we upload more inspirational Muslim videos.